Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Rethink Connectivity. My name is Jeremy, and today we're going to be continuing our journey learning all about Nat's Jetstream. But instead of covering consumers and all of the settings, we're actually going to be working on a practical example all about building a job queue or a worker queue inside of NAT. Now, a worker queue is a super common pattern that's used across a ton of different systems. It's probably one of the most common queuing patterns, and you can see a lot of its semantics kind of surface in products like you know, RabbitMQ and frameworks like um, Sidekick or Celery that are built on top of like Redis and Postgres and things like that. Um, and I wanted to kind of you know use this time to talk through what a practical example looks like like and how Jetstream can kind of be molded and shaped into all kinds of different expressions of distributed systems, um, specifically with this durable queue in this episode today. And so I'm going to give you kind of a high level overview in case you don't know what I'm talking about when I say job queue, durable queue, worker queue, and, um, and then we'll dive into the code and we'll write this thing together from scratch. Um, this is going to be a totally super fun episode. Um, it answers a lot of questions that we've gotten from the community over the last couple of years. And and I think we're going to have a ton of fun building it. So let's get started. Want to learn even more about NATS and distributed systems? Well, we have a live event coming up called RethinkCon 2024. It's coming up right after the new year. So head on over to Synadia.com, click on the banner up top, and register for RethinkCon 2024. You're going to hear from community members and authors all about NATS and how the project is continuing to evolve. And so you're not going to want to miss that. Go ahead and save your spot. It's free. So what do I mean when I say a job queue? Well, typically um, when folks are implementing something like a job queue, you first start with a publisher. A publisher, you know, publishes a job. Typically it's because, you know, they, they need this job to be processed by, you know, somebody else um, or they can't process it in line. Maybe this comes from, you know, directly from the, the web, you know, middleware stack and uh, this needs to be processed in the background. Think like sending emails or being able to process payments, um, something that needs to go into a queue and needs to be, you know, processed in an order fashion. And so publishers, you know, go ahead and publish a message onto the queue. In our case, this is going to be um, a Jetstream uh, work queue stream, which we'll configure in a second. Um, and as you can see, some of these messages are kind of, you know, labeled as high or low. And that's because we're kind of using some priority semantics. Now, uh, NAS Jetstream doesn't have priority semantics built in to um, Jetstream itself. In fact, you just you can have priority semantics by um, using our subject-based addressing. And I'm using high and low here, but you could use as many as you want, and they don't even have to be priorities. They could be you know addressed by something specific to your business. Maybe you have different types of jobs that need to be processed differently, or have different types of workers. Um, you can use these subjects for um, you know to really define anything here. In our case, we're going to be using them to um, define uh, particular priorities. And as you can see here, um, in this architecture diagram, we have a worker pool, a, a high level worker pool um, that has like, you know, a bunch of resources dedicated to it, and then a low worker pool that has less resources dedicated to it. Um, and if you remember in our very last episode, when I talked about streams, um, specifically configuring a work queue stream, I said it could only have one consumer. So I'm sure you're wondering, well, how can you have you know a, a worker pool high and a worker pool low if you could only have one consumer? Well, I was not completely honest when going over the work queue stream. You can actually have multiple consumers in a work queue stream as long as the subjects that they're interested in don't overlap. And um, so today we're going to kind of dive into how that works and how you can create filter subjects for particular consumers um, and actually have this work queue stream um, you know, work the way that we want it to. Now, once these uh, messages get processed, they get deleted from the queue. So essentially, you can look at the size of the queue as kind of your in-progress work. But what happens when something goes wrong? Well, if a message fails to be delivered or to be processed by one of these worker pools, um, Jetstream is automatically going to retry. And it, that's a configurable setting to set, you know, how many times we want to retry, as well as what the backoff policy looks like, which we'll explore today. Um, but what happens when you've gotten all the way through your retries? Um, 
this is where a dead letter queue comes in. And some products create, you know, a dead letter queue as a first class citizen. Nats Jetstream doesn't. Um, and there's some reasons for that. We think dead letter queues are a very specific pattern and we want we wanted to be able to express it, but not necessarily bake it into Jetstream as, uh, you know, as a core thing. But there's some features that are a part of Jetstream that makes building dead letter queues really, really easy. Um, and you don't have to write any code for it. It's all based off of configuration, which is, which is great. Um, and so when a job kind of you know exceeds its max retries, um, one of the things to consider is that it stays there in the stream. It doesn't get deleted. So in a work queue stream, messages are going to be you know coming in and out because they're going to be processed and then deleted and processed and then deleted. But if a message you know cannot be processed, it will stay there in the stream until you either manually acknowledge it or manually delete it. And that's something to bear in mind is if you have, you know, a bunch of failures, it's going to stack up um, your your queue size and you're going to wonder, you know, what do I do with that? And in, today we're going to cover exactly what you should be doing with it um, so that you could keep your queues kind of clean um, and make sure that, you know, you have good hygiene and that you're not, you know, running into any sort of production outages or issues related to, um, you know, your queue getting backed up. And so failed messages, they stay in the stream until they're acknowledged or deleted. And we'll kind of cover how we want to work with that. Um, but the cool thing is, is you could build your own dead letter queue because we have some uh, Jetstream advisories that you could listen to and actually insert into a queue so you can know, hey, which messages have had its, their maximum failed deliveries. And um, you know, so I can kind of inspect them and figure out what to do with them. Um, and so we're gonna be covering this whole kind of architecture today um, from scratch, and you're gonna just build it alongside me. Um, I know it seems like a lot, but this is um, actually pretty easy to work through. Um, we're gonna be working in Go today, and we're going to be working with Synedia Cloud, and we're gonna be working with the NAT CLI. So let's just jump straight in and start writing some code. Okay, so uh, the first thing that we want to do is we want to create our actual jobs stream. And we're, I'm gonna use the NAT CLI to do that because that's what a lot of folks are familiar with. I'm gonna say NAT uh, stream list. And um, I'm using Synedia Cloud, by the way. Uh, Synedia Cloud's one of the easiest ways to kind of get started with Nats. Um, you know, you have a full UI available to you here. You can, you know, monitor things pretty easily. You can, um, you know, go ahead and create your streams here if you wanted to. I'll, I'll create another stream here um, in just a sec. But let's use the Nats CLI, um, which is connected to Synedia Cloud, and we'll create our streams. So I'm going to say Nats stream uh, create, and I'm just going to call this stream jobs. It's going to ask me what subjects I want. Um, the way I'm going to uh, make this work is going to do jobs.star.star. .star .star. The first token is going to be the priority. So it can be like high or it could be low. Um, we'll just keep that star. And the second one will be kind of like the jobs ID. And this is very common in, you know, job and background processing frameworks is you, you might, you know, have a, a certain ID or type for a job. This could be something like, you know, send welcome email or something like that. Um, and so, so you can have uh, different types of jobs and you can you know, also maybe filter on them or process them differently um, depending on how you kind of work out your consumer model. But for now, I think this is a good kind of subject hierarchy for our jobs. So we're going to say, let's just capture everything that uh, works with that. This is gonna be a file store. We're gonna just keep replication at one. Um, and this is where you know we want to make sure that we select a work queue here because this is going to put everything in the queue and as soon as they're acknowledged or processed we're going to obviously have them just fall off of the queue. Um, now this is interesting. When you're doing a work queue, um, I like to do discard policy new because if my queue gets backed up, I don't want to start deleting old messages. I in fact want to start um, actually rejecting uh, anything else being added onto the queue once I've hit my limit. And so I'm going to set discard policy to new. Um, my stream messages limit, usually these queues have some sort of limit on them. Um, I'm just going to set mine to 20,000. Um, that's probably pretty low, um, but you know, just for illustration purposes. You might want to set kind of a cap on this um, just to make sure for your monitoring or your operational purposes, you're kind of meeting your SLAs there. Um, we can skip per subject message limit. Um, total stream size will keep at 256 megs. And then message TTL is a really interesting one. When I talked about you know messages that uh, are have failed to deliver and Jetstream will no longer deliver them because they've reached their max attempts, they're going to stay there inside of the stream. Um, and 
you know, unless I acknowledge them or delete them myself. And I don't want these to indefinitely back up. Um, in fact, I'm okay having, you know, a sort of lifetime to my, my dead messages, um, for my dead letter queue. So I'm just going to set this to like a retention policy of seven days, but this could be, you know, a day, it, it could be hours or it could be 30 days. Um, you know, it's, it's really up to you, uh, how, how long, you know, you want to take to be able to kind of comb through and process, you know, dead messages. Uh, max message size will keep pretty much everything else will kind of keep as a default and then there we go we have our actual job queue stream um, let's go ahead and list it out okay so we don't have any messages in in it but we could start putting messages in it so i'm going to use the nats bench command to start putting some messages in here so this is just an example of saying i know about five thousand messages in here that say um, jobs hi send email um, Again, just kind of making up the use case as we go along here. Uh, and then let's go ahead and put some, uh, some low jobs in here as well. We'll go Nats Bench and we'll say clean old upload. I don't know what kind of application I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, writing right now, but um, this is just, again, an example of maybe uh, as an application developer, you're creating different types of jobs and you want those to be processed. And this is just going to be a low priority one. So I'll go ahead and add another you know, 5,000 messages there. Um, and using the NAT CLI, I can also just inspect, you know, what, what's currently in the stream, um, what needs to be processed. I could say NATS uh, stream um, subjects uh, for jobs. Yep. And that's going to say, okay, we'll have 5,000 of the clean old upload and low priority queue and 5,000 of the send email and the high priority queue. Great. So we have uh, actual messages in our queue and um, you know, now we can start actually processing them. So let's create a worker um, in Go that's going to go ahead and process items in that queue. So I'm going to just call this uh, worker.go package main and func main. And we're going to use this program to drive both our low priority and our high priority workers. And so let's um, parse some arguments just so we can kind of reuse this as much as possible. Um, and we, we want to have some good like monitoring and logging for this as well. So I'm going to just say uh, it has a priority and an ID. And those are going to be coming from um, OS args one and two quite naturally. Uh, and then we can use these to kind of create um, the name for our Jetstream consumer, as well as kind of just a worker name to use for, for both logging and for uh, monitoring. So I'm going to say consumer name, and this is going to be formatted. Um, yeah, we'll do sprintf, and we're going to call this worker underscore priority. There we go. Um, if I know how to spell it right, there we go. Um, so that's our consumer name. And then we want our worker name, which will be uh, similar. It will just be, um, yeah, worker, priority, and ID. And so we'll use this kind of as our identifier for each particular process. Um, and that is our labeling. Um, let's go ahead and set our logging to um, use this particular label because I'm going to be running multiple instances of this. So I want to run like 10 maybe inside of the high priority queue and then maybe like two inside of the low priority queue. And that's going to kind of simulate like resource allocation and stuff like that. Um, so let's go ahead and say uh, log.default. We'll just tweak our default logger and we'll set our prefix to our worker name. Perfect. Um, okay, so now that we have kind of our logging set up, let's go ahead and connect to NATS. I'm going to say um, and see NATS connection and error is NATS.connect. And instead of connecting to our default URL, we're going to connect to uh, NATS NGS because we are using a Stenadia cloud. And so I'm going to say um, connect.ngs.global. And then we want to set our NATS name to of the connection to our worker name. So and call this worker name, and then we need some credentials to connect with. Um, now, if you're just doing this, you know, with a local NATS, you know, server, and you don't have any auth, don't worry, you don't have to do any sort of uh, credentialing. But um, I like to keep things generally secure. And so, if I go into Cineda Cloud and I go to users here, I can easily create a user for whatever worker I want. I could say worker high, which, by the way, I already have. I already have worker high and worker low here, and I have them downloaded. Um, you can go ahead and create these inside of the uh, inside of Cineda Cloud. Click here and click download credentials over here at the top under Get Connected, and then throw those credentials, um, you know, in your working directory. 
Okay, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and say nats.user credentials and I'm going to again format sprint f and actually I don't need a format here. Let's just go ahead and say um, consumer name plus creds. Okay. We can then handle this error right here and let's just say log.fatal if there's an error. And now we've connected to NATS, perfect. Um, let's go ahead and close that on a defer. Um, and now we can start connecting to Jetstream. So I'm going to uh, use the new Jetstream API that we've been using in the past episodes. Um, but to, in order to do that, we do need a context to pull into all of our calls. So I'm going to say uh, context.background. There we go, if I can spell this. We're gonna use the context package for that. And then we can start calling Jetstream, whoops. Okay, so um, like I said, we're gonna use the new Jetstream API. So I'm going to say consumer and error, and we're going to cr uh, create or update a consumer. I could have created the consumer inside of the NAT CLI, but I feel like this is a nice kind of like, you know, package to just, you know, put all in one program. Um, like I've said before in previous episodes, you can use the NAT CLI, you can use, um, you know, I could use Synedia Cloud, or I could do it right here in the code to create my streams and consumers. It's all part of the Jetstream API, and there's plenty of, ways to, to go ahead and do that. Um, so let's go ahead and create our Jetstream context. Um, I'm going to say uh, JS and error equals Jetstream dot new. There we go. And we'll go ahead and handle that error. And then to get our consumer, we will say create or update consumer. And we'll pass in our context as the first arg. The stream is the second arg, which is jobs the one we just created. And then we need a uh, jetstream.consumer config. And I think I showed this in a previous episode. There's a lot of options for consumers. And in the next episode, we'll cover a lot more of these. Um, but for now, we can, uh, we can delete a lot of them, but uh, we'll take consumer name and we'll set it for the name and the durable. That way this consumer sticks around. Um, for the description, we could say something like, um, you know, worker, high work or low yeah we'll use the priority there let's delete all of these for now um, and we will uh, put in our replay policy and so um, so remember when a message is has failed to deliver or it's not acknowledged uh, under a certain amount of time Jetstream will try attempt to re-deliver that message and it's completely configurable how you want the re-delivery to work I can say how many re-deliveries I want to attempt before you know I stop re-delivery and I can also have my own kind of policy for back off that's exactly what we're going to do so we're going to say um, we want a max deliver attempt of four in this instance, and then we want to configure kind of our back off timings here. And so um, the way that this works is you just pass in a, a time.duration slice in Go. Other places this will be just be like a list of timings. Um, and then here I can uh, start configuring, you know, how I want things to back off. So maybe I first want to wait for, you know, five um, seconds. And this is how long it's waiting for an acknowledgement. So if, if the job doesn't get back to you in, in five seconds, then it's going to attempt to, to, to re-deliver it. Uh, if it doesn't get back in, you know, uh, then it's going to try 10 and then 15, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so this is really cool because I always ask people like, hey, have you ever built something like a, you know, webhook or an exponential back off for like a webhook system? And almost, you know, nearly everybody has. And I'm like, oh yeah, that was annoying. And you could do all of this straight inside of Jetstream without really having to write much code. A lot of it's just configured. Um, which I find really, really neat. The last part that we need for our consumer is we need to add a um, we need to add a filter subject. Remember, I said that we want to have a low priority and a high priority, and we don't want them to stomp on each other. And um, if I just you know tried to ship this as is, I'm actually going to get an error because I'm going to try to create two consumers that overlap with each other for this work queue stream. So um, in the new newer version of a NATS server, you can actually pass in multiple filter subjects, which I think is pretty cool. And in this case, we're going to be using our um, priority that we uh, that we set. And so we can do something like this: jobs dot high or jobs dot low dot star. Um, and and that way we can kind of keep all of these consumer filter subjects separate, and we could run them side by side, which is great. 
And that's really all that we need to uh, create and configure our consumer. Let's go ahead and handle um, this error here. And let's go ahead and start consuming um, messages for this consumer. So uh, to do that, we're going to do um, exactly what we did in a previous episode. We're going to use the consume function. So I'm going to say consumer.consume. And here you pass it a function that takes a, a, a Jetstream message. And this is our Jetstream message handler. And we have to um, make sure that we you know, will log and will acknowledge um, that we've received this message. Um, now one thing that, one additional thing that I think will be fun to do is um, show you guys Jetstream metadata. And so every single message in Jetstream as you're consuming it has metadata about the message, whether you know it's the, the sequence number for the stream or the sequence number for the consumer. Um, there's a bunch of little goodies there and we're gonna use the stream sequence number to kind of identify that message. So as we see stuff scroll by, we'll see kind of the numbers essentially incrementing. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna say meta and error is uh, message.metadata. And let's go ahead and handle that error. We'll just say uh, log dot you know, print len. Um, yeah, that, that should be good. And then um, we can knack that message if we want to, because we failed to parse that metadata, and we'll return. Um, all right, so now we can use that metadata when we're printing over here. I'm going to say. Um, Put a new line here, and then um, instead of a string, I'm going to go ahead and say a message or sorry meta dot uh, sequence for our particular stream, and this needs to be a digit. There we go. Um, so now we've said that we've received our message and we acknowledge our message, so we could just process all of these um, messages kind of one by one. Um, in each of our workers, which is great. Uh, the last thing I want to do is because this is going to run really, really quickly. Um, let's actually just put a sleep in here um, before we acknowledge the message. So I'm going to say time dot uh, sleep, and um, we will still make this go pretty fast. Um, let's go ahead and just say 10 milliseconds. Um, this is just a really fast worker, but we're going to be chunking through a bunch of messages, um, and that's really all that we need to consume from uh, this particular consumer. Um, but now we need to make sure that we handle any errors that might crop up as well as uh, have a graceful shutdown. So I'm going to go ahead and copy some code because I always forget what the graceful shutdown code looks like um, in Go. Here we go. So we have our graceful shutdown uh, with a signal.notify and then uh, this c.stop we could actually just per put in a defer statement um, as well. And there we go. That's all that we need to be able to kind of consume messages, create that consumer um, for that work queue. And it's going to work for both low and high um, priority consumers. So let's go ahead and check out what this looks like. So in order to run these workers, I'm going to just use xargs with uh, the parallel flag. And um, that way we can kind of run through and say, okay, we're going to run 10 of these um, high priority workers. So let's go ahead and uh, we name this worker.go. Um, let's go ahead and run this and see if it works. Okay, so now it's crunching through all of those 5,000 messages and it looks like it's doing so um, fairly quickly, which is great. Um, and you could also see that there's some messages that it, you know failed to deliver and it got re-delivered, which is great. Um, let's go ahead and do the same thing with our worker low and this time we're just going to use two workers and it's gonna, um, oops, worker.go. And this time it's going to crunch through it um, a bit slower. But as you could see, when I go over to Synadia Cloud, um, I should be able to see my particular stream over here. I have my job stream and it has 3,300 messages right now. Um, it has two consumers and it looks like the worker high has um, processed all of its messages and worker low is still going through and processing all of its messages. It's almost done. And so that's an example of, okay, cool. We have a low priority and a high priority kind of queue going on. Um, and now we can start you know, working on some of the other semantics here. And so um, we got high and low priority. So what happens when we want to start using some dead letter queues? Well, first let's go ahead and tweak our code to introduce a little bug. Let's go back to the code. And I'm going to say um, right here inside of the consume function, I'm going to say uh, if, um, let's see, if priority is low, then 
we will say something along the lines of, you know, error processing message. And let's just get rid of this and say this is a print lin. And then we're just going to return. We're going to fail to acknowledge this message. And so that way, you know, um, not only am I just doing, I'm not doing like a, I could do something like this. I could say, you know, message.nac. Uh, what this is going to do is it's going to actually retry that message immediately. Um, alternatively, I could do something like a message.nac with delay. And that will allow me to configure like, hey, I can't process this message right now, but go deliver it to me, you know, under this circumstance, um, you know, or in this timing. I don't want to do either of those because what if, you know, one of these workers cannot respond and it needs to shut down or it's hanging or whatever. Um, I want Jetstream to kind of pick up on that fact and know, oh, this thing's you know, essentially timing out. Let's go and retry it. And so um, I'm just going to go ahead and return. And so all of the low priority messages are now going to not be acknowledged. They'll time out. Jetstream will try to re-deliver them a maximum of four times over that particular um, uh, back off policy that we set right here. And then it's eventually going to um, it's eventually going to stop delivering those messages. So before we start with this, I want to go over um, the advisory that we talked about. Um, basically, Jetstream when it's you know when it's exceeded its max delivery attempts, it's going to uh, emit a new event. Um, and I'll give you the subject right here, a brand new event that's going to say, hey, this particular message, you know, in this particular stream and consumer has um, basically reached its max limits. And that's where we're going to be able to utilize kind of our dead letter queue semantics. So let's go ahead and create a new stream. Um, and this time we're going to use that stream to kind of drive um, our dead letter queue. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into um, Synadia Cloud. I'm gonna create a brand new stream over here. And I'm just gonna call this jobs DLQ. I'm gonna say a dead letter queue for jobs stream. Okay. And then under subjects, I'm going to go ahead and add um, this special subject right here. Uh, there's a lot of events, by the way, um, and I, I guess you can't necessarily see this here. Let me tweak my window. There's a lot of events, by the way, um, you know, inside of Jetstream that you can use. And you can see all these through the NAT CLI via the schema command. Um, you could also see a lot of them in our documentation. Um, but this is just one of them. And so you get a JS event advisory that says a consumer has exceeded its max deliveries. Um, and then you can say, you know, what stream you want this for. Um, and then you can say what consumer you want this for. And so if I wanted to you know, capture all of the, you know, max delivery uh, uh, attempts uh, on a message for every single, you know, stream and every single consumer across my entire application or my entire NATS deployment, I can do that um, here. Uh, here. But for now, we're just going to look at the job stream, and but we want to capture every consumer because maybe I, you know, I have a low priority, I have a high priority, maybe I want to add a medium priority and I don't want to have to change the dead letter queue semantics here. So we're going to capture everything um, that, that fails uh, or exceeds its max delivery attempts from the jobs queue. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. And that's going to create a new stream there. Now uh, let's go ahead and fire up that um, worker low now that we have the priority or now that we have that kind of bug that we introduced. I'm going to go ahead and refire that back up and see if we get that new message. Oh, first, we probably should uh, put more events here. Let's see. Uh, bench. Here we go. So we're going to publish some more events in the low queue, and you can see we have error processing message. And this is going to wait, you know, those first five seconds, and then it just happened now. Now it's going to wait 10 seconds, and then 15 seconds, and eventually close out. And so we're going to just kind of hang out here um, for a little bit. Uh, I can actually probably go ahead and subscribe to that stream. I'm going to say Nats um, sub stream jobs DLQ, and we haven't gotten any messages yet. But um, you know, we're going to wait here until uh, our max delivery attempts have succeeded, and make sure that we get all the messages that we can. Okay, so we just received all of these messages inside of our queue, and it's going to keep going. I think this is the first thousand, and then, you know, based off of how we configured our consumer. Um, but one of the things that's interesting to notice here is, yeah, we got our subject that we expected, our max deliveries, jobs, worker low. But we also get a lot of other cool information here. Um, we get the stream that this came in on. So if we're, you know, putting all of our stream max deliveries inside of, uh, 
you know, inside of one particular dead letter queue, we can identify the stream. We can uh, look at what consumer it came from. Because uh, remember, you can have multiple consumers um, on a lot of different streams. And then, um, and then we also get the stream sequence, which is really important here. So um, the reason we want the stream sequence is we could do something like Nats um, stream get jobs and that ID. And that's going to give us the actual message that, um, you know, that failed. Now, I didn't pass any payloads into this particular message, so that's why you're not seeing any sort of, you know, uh, information there. Um, but we did get the subject. Um, you would normally get your payload. You get, you know, headers. You get everything because the message is still there. It's not going to be deleted until, you know, seven days from now. Um, but what I can do is I can either have a bit of automation that could, you know, go through these, check them, delete ones that we know are safe, or we can have kind of a human in the loop kind of intervention um, where we can just look at, through the dead letter queue. You can even consider like building a little UI on top of this where you're, you're going through this particular dead letter queue stream and pulling out the messages and stuff like that. So there's a lot of really neat things that you could do, um, you know, with that advisory and with dead letter queues. Um, and I think it's pretty neat. One last thing that I want to close out with that I, I think is pretty cool is that there's a brand new feature inside of the NAT server where you can set stream metadata. Um, and I think this is cool because let's say that you're building a UI or you're building a particular tool to inspect dead letter queue streams. Um, how do you know that a stream is kind of acting as a dead letter queue? Well, that's where kind of stream metadata can really come to the rescue here. So I can do something like NATS stream edit. I'm going to edit my jobs, you know, dead letter queue. And uh, I want to set its uh, metadata, if I can spell it. Um, I could just say, you know, dead letter Q equals true. It's going to have me confirm. And there we go. Our jobs DLQ now has the dead letter Q metadata. And so if I'm building any sort of like tooling or UI around it, I could look through all my streams and I could find the ones that are dead letter queues. And I could say, hey, I want to kind of create a, you know, a special UI around this where I'm looking through these streams, but I'm also kind of pulling out data from um, the, the source streams themselves. Uh, and that's kind of a high level overview of how all of this works. You could see, um, you know, we have our high and our low workers all here inside of our connections in Synedia Cloud. I can group them by, you know, the particular user that they're connected with. Um, there's a lot of great management capabilities when it comes to kind of working through um, worker pools and queues, and it's all built into NATS. As you could see, most everything was configuration. Um, we had like 80 lines of code and most of that was configuration too. Um, so I, I think this is a really good solution to you know replacing something like a RabbitMQ or a Celery or um, a Sidekick. And you get all of the other benefits of like you have KV and object store and microservices all at your fingertips here. So I hope this was a useful kind of example of um, how you would you know, put together a durable job queue with priorities and dead letter queue semantics. Um, do comment down below, give this a like and a subscribe. Um, you know, if you want to hear more about this, uh, give me your feedback. I'd love to kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, what, what, what other things you'd like to see covered inside of, um, you know, describing Jetstream. So thanks so much for giving this a watch and I'll see you next time.